Thanks. Hello, everyone. I think Shubham's talks sets a good pre context uh, for my talk uh, on how to go about doing things. So, today, the aim of this talk is to guys give you an idea how to have a successful bug bounty platform. And if you want to set up a bug bounty program for your organization, how do you go about it? What's the, what all it takes to run a successful bounty program, right? So let's get kick started. So uh, first thing about me, I'm currently head of uh, security, privacy, and trust at Hotstar. Before this, I was with Ola. Before that, Flipkart, Adobe. What I love to do is solve security at scale. Uh, that's one of the first fun thing that I love to do, right? Why am I talking about bug bounties? Is because long time ago, I was, I wouldn't say a bug bounty hunter, I would say a security researcher who used to do sort of bug hunting when there wasn't a bug bounty program such. And I've done quite a few then. From then onwards, I moved from that side of the table to this side of the table where Four years back, sorry, uh, I launched a successful bug bounty platform for an organization that I used to work with, right? And I'll take you through the journey of how things happen and what all it took to do that, right? So before starting, let's have a quick glimpse of what's a bug bounty program, right? I think this picture depicts it clearly, what's a bug bounty program, right? Like it's shake up a tree to get some money out of it. And harder you shake, the more money you get, right? To summarize in points, it's like it's a platform where you receive recognition, reward, bounties for submitting vulnerabilities, right? Why it is such a thing now? Because bug bounty hunters or white hat hackers get paid around roughly two and a half times, 2.7 times more than an average software engineer. And in India, it's way different. It's like it can go up to 16 times, right? That's why it's a big thing now, right? Why do we need a bug bounty program, right? Well, according to a recent research, or probably it's IBM or Sophos, I'm not too sure, where they said cyber criminals have said for them to breach any network, it takes 10 hours, right? If we have to make sure our organizations, our infrastructure is secured, we have to work the way they do, like something the previous talker explained a lot, right? Now, that's why we need the support for the whole bug bounty or white hat hacker community together to make it work. But this is important. Bug bounty is towards the last thing I want to do. It's not the first thing. It's not the fundamental thing. It's the process to identify bugs that have slipped through the cracks. Okay, And that's why you deploy a bug bounty program, not a replacement for your security team. That's really important. Uh, history of slightly some history about bug bounty. Uh, what I recently got to know, the first bug bounty uh, came in 1983 with Hunters and Wedding Corporation. Then Netscape, Nav Navigator 2, launched one in 95 to Mozilla, Pontoon, Google, Facebook, to now all the telecom operators have it, payment companies have it, uh, all the governments have it, hotels have it, adult website have it, right? Uh, and it goes from, like, it has gone from this to finding bugs here and getting this as a gift as well, right? And that's, that's how it transitioned in the last probably two and a half decades. Uh, today's agenda is going to be understanding what are the use cases for you to consider to launch or not to launch or to have or not to have a bug bounty program for your organization. What's the parameter you should think on? What are fears, concerns having a bug bounty program? What things that you run into you haven't thought through while having a bug bounty program? Understanding who does it apply to, so, right? Here we have organization from... 10 people startup to a big, like 1,000, 10,000 people corporations. Does it apply to all? Or what's the thumb rule to understand who does it apply to? Dark side of having, not having one, right? If I don't have one, what are the bad or the worst thing that can happen to me? How to launch your own bug bounty program where things essentials before setting up, uh, launching one? What are the logistics you have to take care? How do you make sure you run a successful one, right? Couple of pitfalls while you're running and how to avoid them. And some yarn from my side, right? Okay. Uh, now, before I give you all that theory of what's needed, what's not needed, I want to give you a quick walkthrough of how I did it four years back at Ola, right? Now, 
when I launched at Ola, it was just two of us, me including in the security team, and we we're doing so many things, and we thought of launching a program. Uh, we had our own things done, which I'll walk you through. And when we decided we wanted, like ideally, probably some of you have interacted with the bug bounty platform, uh, or commercial one. So you know it's like you submit something by a form, someone uh, sends you an email, then there's interaction happening over email, all of it, right? My aim was, it's two people team. If I get 10 bugs in a week, I cannot manage that because I have to do a lot more work. How do I go about automating all, that, all of that stuff? The aim was, like, can I have click buttons where I just click and everything happens? Like, it sounds a bit fancy, but uh, we did achieve to a good level in terms of how do we go about doing it. So that was my aim. Now, doing that, so that's where I wanted to. And post that, what I wanted to have is all the things that would be coming in, how I would be counteracting with them, right? So this was aim of how should a bug bounty platform I should build, right? Uh, and I'll also talk about why not use a commercial one uh, in slightly a couple of slides later, right? So ideally, as I said, like there's a communication channel and everything follows. For me, if it's an email, then it becomes a hard thing. Hey, have I replied to those researchers? Have I fixed those bugs? It's hard to follow up all of those things, right? So what we did is I have video and I have uh, images of these uh, videos to explain you how I did it. So just to tell you, again, the vision was can I have things at a click of a button and how do I explore with minimum uh, hard work put in place with maximum automation to do all of it, right? So, so it works something like this, like you go ahead, fill a form on a page and you submit, right? Okay, you submit the bug, it's all received. Now, ideally it goes to an email account uh, that we had, okay? Now, the point was, I cannot monitor email account, so we need some kind of automation. We, at that point in time, using a ticketing system called Jira, and we went ahead exploring how we could abuse and exploit Jira in a good way to automate all of it, right? Uh, probably, Workflows and things that I'll show you here, you haven't seen, you would have thought Jira exists that way, but it does. And probably after 20 days of exploration, we did a lot of stuff. I'll first show you what it works. All right, one second. Okay, let me pause it here. So what happens is the moment you submit a bug, it goes an email and we wrote a Jira handler to monitor that email and then it comes to Jira. The moment it comes to Jira, it keeps moving. Okay, uh, we had, let's say, some artificial intelligence to understand the criticality of the bug, so we can monitor on how, which are critical bugs that needs to be looked at, because if I'm getting 100 bugs, I need to first focus on the critical P0 bugs, right? Then it gets a lot of details. It has a secret key where we created this to understand each bug, and how do we measure and monitor each bug, and that we're talking to the same person who has submitted X bug, but for that particular bug. Right, all of those things comes in an email, right? Now, if few of you have interacted with Jira, you know there are workflows that are defined where you have buttons to do things, right? So now, when this happens, we wrote a Jira post trigger which sends an automatic email the moment it receives a Jira ticket to the uh, customer, uh, to the third party researcher, saying that, hey, we have received your bug, this is your identifier to use further, and give us some time to validate this bug. This is all automatic, no one's doing. The moment, I'll show you how it's done. And, okay, now, as I said, right, uh, we had few things done, a book, bug could be valid, invalid, I'm not able to reproduce, uh, duplicate, won't fix, out of scope, email is, is an option that we had, how we can interact with the third party researcher uh, or the bug bounty hunter in terms of over the communication. So, and the whole security team needs to jug, just work on this Jira, where everything they say goes as a comment. Every reply that customer says comes as a comment, so everything is tracked here, and we just click buttons, hey, it's valid, it's not, right? So. I'll show an example of send email where if I have to talk to a uh, customer saying that 
my bad, uh, talking with the researcher saying, hey, can you help us with some more details or hold on for some long? So you understand, we just, the, uh, the security team just says thanks for submitting, nothing else, right? What happens at the back end, it's all post things and triggers that we wrote. Let it refresh. Uh, the Jira adds a couple of headers, footers, signatures, uh, the key, all of it, right? We could write anything that we want to. So if you have seen commercial platform, that's like time timeline that goes through where you would interact with the researcher, we do it via Jira because uh, we can do it, the whole organization is used to use Jira, right? Now, let's, let's mark a bug valid. Okay. Go ahead, mark valid. Okay. The moment you mark it valid, the flow changes to, okay, fix in progress. Researcher gets again an auto automated email that, hey, you know what, you have spotted a valid bug. While you evaluate, uh, here are things that you need to look for while we are working on it. Right? Now, then it goes through a fix in progress where engineering team fixes it. They mark it fixed. Then it goes to QA team. They mark it QA done, no regressions. Then it goes to security team. They say, hey, you know what, there is no security bypass. Then they mark, hey, verify from the security researcher itself. And it issues an email to the security researchers that we have deployed a fix. How about you go and see if there are bypasses or the fix is good enough, right? Uh, we have fixed it. How about you just verify it's good enough or not, right? So security team is just clicking buttons, uh, ideally, doing nothing, right? Uh, this is another awesome thing, right? So the moment we want to close a bug, obviously it's a valid bug. We have to figure out how much do we have to pay out to the researcher. So we created another Jira project payout, which only security team and the finance team had access to. What we said, it's an all automated way. The moment I click on, click, sorry, click on close, it creates a new uh, ticket where we can just enter the amount. I'll just show you. And another email will go to researchers saying, hey, we are awarding you this much amount. Uh, how about it? And then the finance team can close the loop. So. This is a test, pay out. We enter the amount, it's, it's a test, and we close. Okay? Now, what you see here, it's, it goes down. So, a new, it's not coming in, okay. For some reason, the blow thing is getting disconnected. Okay, so as a payout ticket was getting created, which is not visible here, uh, and if I refresh my Gmail account, the researcher refreshes his Gmail account, a new email gets triggered to him, asking him about, again, tons of things in terms of, hey, uh, here is something that we are paying you out, here are the details and everything, right? So this was the front end of how security team has automated everything and they, so at Jira you could just create a dashboard so I know how many bugs are open, in which state, uh, how many critical bugs are there, uh, how long are we taking to fix critical bugs, all of it together, right? Okay, uh, here is something that I'll show you how we abuse Zira in a good way is, this would be probably the most mess up the workflow of Jira that you have seen, uh, would be something like this. So, Right, I cannot tell you like, after I was done with this, I started even uh, when we wanted to hire a Jira admin, I started interviewing Jira admins because I knew so much about Jira, thing that it had was really, uh, I didn't knew that Jira could do so much, right? Uh, how we created bug manglers, uh, posts, triggers, pre-triggers, triggers to itself, right? So. So now let's let's see the workflow that I was talking about. Right. So what happens is if any one of you have used Jira or any ticketing system, you know from you had like four or five state on how things flow. Right. Here what we had is here what we had is something really hard. Like just opening an issue sends an email. It can go to X states. I'll just like, I have images on this which I'll walk you through, but just a quick uh, find through of how things could be done. 
like how much effort went in just designing this because it becomes it becomes like hey uh, if this effort we haven't put in we won't be able to automate the thing that you saw on the front end of the jira this is all that went in uh, doing all of it right uh, reopening i'll talk about reopening and how after closing it creates a new ticket for payout right that's how it does and it's a bit messy up right so if i have to just so so as i was showing you right okay something happening so we had post function we wrote all of that right so it's it's as simple as we went ahead created a post function posted a groovy script of whatever we wanted to do whether fetching an email from account handler how to push it and all of that was done at jira this was a one time activity that we did okay one second this was a one time activity that we did which gave us enough bandwidth to manage things for so now as a security or the triage team uh, we just had to click buttons and it goes to the right people whether finance team engineering team qa team or security team or the researcher for that matter so uh, this is something which we did okay what happens i'll just walk you through is as i said right whether the priority comes in by default we wrote a post function for that uh, we create uh, we so jira this key that you see here is created by jira itself nothing else because email comes no form submission comes to an email then to jira right everything is done at jira end itself right now after uh, this researcher receives that email from an open state it can go to either of those five state that you see out of scope won't fix invalid duplicate valid right now the moment we mark anything it sends an email uh, as i showed you now now just telling you right of uh, all the arrows that you see uh these are triggers in itself like close has three four triggers this is something while designing probably i took around just one one week to 10 days to design this workflow because if i launch bug bounty without having this workflow it's going to be manually managing all because i have to figure out what state it goes to and what all it can happen right so from fix from fix in progress to fix there were so many thing that needs to be happening at the same time uh that we have to design and prepare for so the point is how much effort went in as a one time to automate all of it right uh the moment we have fix in progress again it goes to qa state where a qa can mark it so everyone was involved the whole organization knew about this that we were launching this we had things like i'll walk you through the theory of how did we prepare all, all of for all of it is everyone was aware we had proper sla in place and completely automated so this is where an email goes to third party researcher to validate that we have uh, identified you know verify the fix that we have deployed to the bug right uh that's that's where he replies yes no and see the close itself can happen from so many places and so many things that needs to happen at the close state it has to create a payout ticket all of that right uh told you you could have for payout for sometimes you want to just pay out goodies we need to have an option for that amount that we have to pay out it comes in and the payout email that goes so we need to have bunch of these information right uh whether we have to send goodies to you you want hall of fame or not this is a different identifier from the bug you have sub submitted because this goes as a payout uh, ticket and it, it this is something that finance team keeps a track of things right uh that's that's it uh, now this was how we automated all of it right but before even we went to the stage there was a lot of back end things that went in where we had to prepare everyone for the bug bounty itself right where should we have it should we not have it all of the agenda agendas that we talked i talked about would be here right cool uh consideration for the bug bounty program so here the problem is few companies launch a bug bounty program for the right reason few do it for not so the right reason right uh some examples of some reasons where if you're launching bug bounty for this purpose wouldn't be a good idea right you think crowdsourcing security is a good alternative to have uh, is a replacement for a security team 
bad idea. You'll only pay out for the bugs people find. Now you don't have to pay a full-time researcher, you just pay out for the bugs anyone find. So if you think having a team to exploit your system before you have enough security in place, think about it, right? Because bug bounty hunters are people who want to exploit system. Like the last talk, you saw how we can go out about and exploiting where people pay enough money just for something that was committed to GitHub, right? Uh, you think, hey, you know what? This is a nice way of getting assessment of an application done. To avoid bad PR uh, situations, because there has been a case probably a year, two years back, where a food tech startup was forced to have a bug bounty program uh, because the way they didn't have it, and some uh, researcher went ahead, wrote publicly, and they were in a situation, now we need to have one, right? You don't want to be in a situation that, and you start having bug, bug, bug bounty program, bad idea. You think, hey, you know, like, instead of having two people doing all of it, let's have, like, 100 people, 1,000 people doing it? Nope. The reason you should be thinking of, plus the season, is a good idea, right? The first thing is to atta uh, understand attacker's approach. Like, when a bug bounty hunters or white hat hackers test your system, you understand, from what all things people are looking at your apps, from what all different perspective they are looking at your apps, right? You want to have an open connect with the security community. The point of security community is not, hey, I'll pay you, just do it. It's all about how you build a repo with them to make sure they help you and how would you help them, apart from bug bounty itself. Uh, you should understand, if you have baked in security sec uh, and a security team, you want to understand the resilience and the robustness of those baked in security mechanisms that you have. You could get a variety of outputs over a longer period of time because as people at the security team tends to have a bias because they know this application or services are good enough always, so they tend to have biases. That's where a bug bounty hunter can help you if things have slipped through the cra cracks. How to go about building a detection preventer system? So this again is a very good point where you want to understand what kind of People will attack you so you can build a robust detection and monitoring system, right? Eliminating bias, understanding your attack surface area. But again, bug bounty is not a replacement for your penetration testing team. It's just an additional step to understand the things that have fallen through the cracks, right? Now, what's a fear of a bug bounty program, right? This image depicts clearly what's the problem with the bug bounty program, whether it's a real bug or it's a fake bug, right? For me to identify it and I'm scared of it, it's it gonna be a problem, right? So the biggest problem organization have having, uh, thinking of a bug bounty program is can I trust these people? I don't know them, I don't have an NDA with them, I don't know how would they go about, so can I trust them, right? Uh, it becomes too risky because I get a nub for an organization point of view because if I say I'm a bug bounty, I have a bug bounty program, it puts too much attention to me. Now, People who probably till yesterday didn't care about me want to get easy money out and I become the center of attention. Do I want to be? It becomes a bit risky, a gray area. Like, uh, will I get uh, bombarded with vulnerabilities? Like, how would I handle the scale of issues that would come in, right? I'll, I have a quick stats to answer you this. Uh, does it gives license to people to exploit our apps, right? I don't want people to exploit our apps. As a CEO of a company, I wouldn't want that ever, right? Having a bug bounty program doesn't define anything where it, it's wrong, it's right, right? Uh, can I have a PR incident? Like the example I can talk about here is, I have an image later where someone submitted a bug to Facebook, the team said it's not a valid bug, as a proof of concept, he went ahead, posted. The vulnerability was he can post on anyone's wall and he, the guy went ahead and posted on Mark Zuckerberg's wall. Now, if that happens, do you think uh, whoever is responsible for security and Mark's call him, how would he respond, right? Uh, it's, it's hard to manage, right? The last example that I gave to you. Some may have opinion, it gives a, it, it's a rewarding behavior for having, uh, uh, sorry, rewarding a bad behavior itself. Uh, yes and no. Right, like you're saying, I'm gonna give you money if you find a bug to my app. It helps you, but it does reward you a bad, uh, rewarding a bad behavior. 
All right? So, okay, I'll just move around. So this is a, a stats from Hacker's Trophy where they talk about uh, valid issues. So what they say on Hacker's Trophy, you get out of 100, 23.3% are valid bugs, out of 100 submitted bugs. Two, at Facebook, out of 100 submitted bugs, only four bugs are valid. The rest are invalid. Now, all of them, so three are commercial platform to manage bug bounties, two have their own bug bounty programs, right? Now, think for those two companies where it's 5% and 4%. The rest bugs are invalid. Like, if they have automation, they, someone is clicking invalid for like 96, 97 bugs, correct? So, how should, we, should I have it or not, right? So, pointers of now, we talked about what are the actual use cases to have a bug bounty program? What are fears and concerns of having one, right? Now let's talk about how do I identify, should I have a bug bounty program as an organization or not? Because I could be a payment company, I'm already compliance with RBI, PC, IDSS, XYZ, right? I'm all good, why do I need to have one, right? I'm a CRM or a ticket management startup, right? I know the person who's submitting via an email ticket, and I have a team inside who manages all those tickets. I, I know those two people. Do I need one, right? E-commerce aggregation, right? It's like if I have to ship a product to an e-commerce, I know his email, phone, address. What bad could, like, what's the export that could happen? The same goes with cab aggregation, right? The customer's gonna onboard my cab, uh, I know his uh, pickup address, drop address. Why, why do I need a, program, a bug bounty program? Non-IT companies, HR, finance, supply chain, do they need one? Content website where there's user generated contents. Uh, it's like, hey, I don't care about anything. People can post anything and that's it, right? Communication platform like Slack or anything where two people talking to each other, they know each other, right? I'm talking to, let's say, uh, Kiran here, I know I'm talking to Kiran, and Kiran knows he's talking to Shalab. How can a bug bounty program adds a value for those organizations, right? Uh, online registry, like NPM Dockers, like DevOps conference, you think like it's all trusted, signed, everything is there. We know what happened with Docker a few months back. We know what happened with NPM a year or so back, right? Now, how do I define there's a thumb rule to understand is my organization eligible to have a bug bounty program or what's the timeline for an organization to have a one, right? The point is bug bounty program, as I said, is a good to have feature provided you have a security team, right? Uh, whether you are 20 people startup, whether you are a startup which has just in, uh, interacted or has API integration with all the other apps, the point is if you have enough decent security in place, you can live without bug bounty program. It's always a good to have thing, but a security is a must have thing, right? Uh, security evangelization. So understand, security is all about exploiting and exploring the nuances. In an, as a logical statement, payment companies is all good. Docker registries are all good, right? A security guy goes ahead and exploits the nuances which becomes a problem. As, as a company, payments are all set up, sorted, right? Uh, dark side of not having one, right? Let's say, hey, uh, now I think probably whatever category I fall into, I don't think I need a security a bug bounty program, right? Well, if you don't have one, so I have presented here two points of view from researcher's point of view and um, from uh, organization point of view. From researcher point of view, see, whether you have, whether you don't have, researchers won't stop poking holes around in your website or app, right? You can't stop that. You cannot say, hey, I don't run, why are you wasting your time and asking me to pay you for the bug that you have found? That's a valid statement, but they are there, it's internet, everyone can do what they want, right? From a researcher point of view, it comes to like, hey, they found something, they're not able to contact the right person in the company, uh, and it's a critical bug, it's getting ignored, it's not getting fixed, so they think because it's a critical bug, the, way, the right way to go about it is uh, writing publicly about it, right? Versus for an organization, it's like, hey, writing a full disclosure becomes a problem, right? I don't want people to write about what kind of bugs people found on my application, right? Bombarded with simple issues, people threatening and bug bounty hunters, 
your logs got lit up. Believe me, like people are gonna run all kind of scanners to do all of that. Okay, you can't close high critical bugs in a timeline, right? In a few days, you cannot do. How would outside world react to that? Um, hackers disclose vulnerability or they sell on the dark web. So you think, hey, not having one is better because I don't know if they sell it outside, right? How to go about launching one? So we have talked about consideration, we have talked about fear and concerns, who does it applies to, and the dark side of not having one. To launch one, I'll just quickly rush through because I have just 10 minutes left. So you have seen a demo of how it looks like the automated way, but a lot more goes in without that as well, right? The, the first thing is the ingredient itself, like you need to have a platform, you have to engage the searchers, you have to set up the workflows, how would you try it, all of that, and how would you pay, right? So that's, that's a 50,000 feet view of what needs to be there in a bug bounty program. If I funnel it down for you, a 30,000 feet view is where you want everything operated. Who doesn't want to be a rich rich where everything happens all by itself? To do that, to build that kind of an automation, what you need is a communication channel, a ticketing system, well communicated SLA because engineering team do not have understanding of how critical the bug is. And you have to get, depending on the RC or the remote code uh, or the command execution, you want to get it in few hours fixed. So this has to be set up with your engineering team as well. Uh, no one should have access to your bug bounty tickets as well apart from the security team. Uh, what's the workflow? The thing that I showed you, I know I'm a bit rushing through, you can catch me offline, but I just want to give you an idea and cover the whole set, set of slides. So workflow, what you need to have. So what I showed you is one way to have it, not the best way or not the right way. Uh, that works for me, may not work for you, right? How would you set up things with payments team, uh, logistics for bug bounty, buy-ins from legal PR team, measurement of KPIs, how successful is your program, right? Evangelization. So the biggest thing is before launching one, you want to go, if you're responsible for security in your team, you want to go to leadership, hey, we want to launch a bug bounty program. Now, these are the things they are concerned about. These, you should have answer to these things before reaching out to them, okay? So this image depicts what their concern is. How would we handle all the attention? What if people, instead of reporting, exploit vulnerabilities? Uh, is it good to ask people to exploit a system? Like, think of this, instead of your DevOps shoes, think from a CEO perspective. Would you want that? That's, that's the leadership problem they have, and you have to make them comfortable before launching one, right? Uh, repercussions, if we can't patch things within a defined SLA. Do we need a formal, formal one or if someone submits, we'll pay them out. This becomes a problem because if you have bug bounty program, you have defined out of scope, in scope vulnerabilities. If you don't have one, they can do whatever you want and you're gonna be in a bad shape, right? Why can't we do with third party security testing companies? Does it put a target on my back, right? If you could give your leadership team confidence on these things, they can help you to understand how does they value infrastructure importance in the organization and with the budget, obviously, right? Finance team, India specific. Uh, okay, finance teams work in a very standard way. It's been there for last, I don't know, couple of decades. They work for everything. They have to give money out. They need a PO, invoice, or anything. Now you're saying, hey, you have to give a guy who we don't know, we cannot identify his validity, a couple of thousands of rupees, right? Good luck setting up with that, right? Uh, how would you validate researchers? If I have given him money, how do we get a receiving thing from a researcher that they have received and they are the right person to receive? Like, this is a typical finance mindset. They have, you have to convince them to have bug bounty program too, right? Uh, how do you verify the person who submitted the bug and who's sent his account details are the same person? Do you pay in dollar or INR, depending how many countries do you work in, right? You need PAN card details, where will you store the PAN card details? Tax reduction, budget utilization. So it's like, for finance team, these two images depicts what they worry about, what their concern is, and how do you help them to fix these things that, hey, you know what, I've taken care, I can catch hold of this rat and that dog, right? Uh, security team, uh, preparation is really important, right? I'll quickly rush through. The point here I'm trying to say, 
Before launching one, you should have fixed all the known bugs. If you haven't, you should have planned on how to handle the PR incident that can happen for a non-fixed bug, right? You need to have an awesome monitoring in place. That image depicts clearly. You don't know what can go wrong. The point is how you can plan things, not prevent. Detect things and plan things that if they go wrong, you'll get to know, okay? Uh, automate things as much as possible. Legal PR team. So again, the image that I talked about, someone wrote on Zuckerberg's wall saying, hey, your team is not able to understand this security issue, and here's a proof. Uh, this is important because this protects your company in a really good manner. Uh, whether you need to have a cybersecurity insurance, yes, that's a thing now. Uh, and how would you handle PR incidents, right? Logistic issues. Now, we launched Bug Bounty program, but your concierge service or your admin team cannot be sending 20 goodies every week. You need to have planned that, set up that process completely, right? Uh, just rewind, you got a leadership bind, you got budget approvals, you got finance team to fund your things. Uh, you have signed off from legal PR team. If things go south, how would you handle? You have taken care of logistics, rules, scope, the security team has taken care of. You have an automated platform to take care of things. Now the question is like, fine, the demo was good, but after this whole theory, it becomes too much. Like, why do I need to manage? Like, I can go with the com like all those commercial platforms, right? My answer to that is, why not, right? It's a one-time thing where you do invest as a one-time activity, take it. Now after I tell you, it's gonna be a weak effort if you want to do it, right? I took around 20 days to, because I was exploring Jira itself. Versus a commercial platform where it's a turnkey solution, you get out of the box reporting, but you gotta pay a platform fee for every bounty that you pay, you have to give a cut of 20, 25% to the fee, uh, to the platform, all of that, right? So if I have to summarize, I'll say it's like, do I want that? Damn yes, okay? But having that, can I maintain it? Question for you to ask. If you could maintain it, go ahead. No one's stopping. Versus, should I buy a model Tesla 3 uh, for $50,000 versus that? A bit of exaggeration, but I hope you're trying to get the point, right? Uh, I'll, I'll skip through this. I have do's and do nots where you, I'll just say two things. You need to have your scoping done properly. What's in scope, what's not in scope. Else you're gonna have an awesome time. And in a bad way, okay? You need to have awesome monitoring in place for everything, right? Uh, do not is do not have your WAF enabled on bug bounty pages because people will be submitting payloads which are attack vectors, and WAF gonna block all of it. So plan around that, right? Don't expect people to read your policies, uh, understand how should they go about it. They're gonna go all berserk. You have to figure out on how you're gonna handle all of that, right? To summarize, if you have a security team like this or you don't have one, because it's as good as not having one, you're gonna be, end up doing that in a bug bounty platform. It's just gonna be burning your company's money, right? Notes, uh, I'll just say, prepare well. Uh, bug bounty, understand the importance of bug bounty. It's not uh, cost effective for penetration testing. If you think of hiring a bug bounty program, understand properly what your hiring strategy is. Like, it, at first it looks good, but, uh, it's a, it's a gray area. I won't say yes to hire or no, not to hire. You have to plan. I can give you inputs on what to do, what not to do uh, later. And it does require effort technically, financially, uh, hum human resources, whether you have commercial or this. Because if you have a platform, you're going to say valid bug, not valid bug, respond to him. That's what you're going to do regardless. You build or you buy, right? So it takes investment. And are you ready for that investment? Not financially, right? That's all I had. I'm up for question. Hope I'm in time. Thank you. Any questions? Sure. So, say. So, say for like a regular size startup uh, in any sector. Would you recommend that they go with um, a third party bug bounty platform or would you, like in which place would you recommend that they make their So, I, as I said, right, this slides the pick. So, 
if if you could afford that yes if you think as a one time investment you need to figure out on how to automate let's say if in you know organization you don't have jira you need to find a way of how to do what i've done right if that's too much yes you can go ahead so i'm not saying the needle moves this is better that's better that depends your size the time you have how fast you want to go to the market what's your budget so yeah sure hi uh, at the start you mentioned that uh, you received a lot of issues uh, and somehow you managed to categorize those issues yes uh, how did you manage to do it at the start of it sure so just to give you guys an idea the start of the program when you say hey you know what i'm launching a bug bounty program i'm going to pay you out this much there's going to be a flood of bugs that are going to coming in valid invalid all of it right the point was if someone is submitting hey you have trace option enabled or option enabled or your apache version this is visible you don't care about that versus someone is saying hi pon in xss sql i remote code execution all of that right now so that's what we did an automation in jira hey if these lies in these kind of categories let's put them as p4 matlab i may look at them because i define an sla p4 i'll look in let's say in a weeks time p0 i'll look in few hours few minutes p1 i'll look in couple of hours or a days time okay so how do i handle is we did categorize in terms of how do we filter out those bugs and put them as a priority as p4 so not a problem to look at right now so that that was our logic of saying hey these bugs i don't look at and jira puts them at p4 so we don't look at them so the way it used to work with us is when we open a jira dashboard we have p1 p2 p3 p4 with aging when it came in all of that right what our focus was p1 p2 and p3 right this is something i can look now that's how i did right i'm not saying that's the only way you could go about doing all the way you want to yes so all this automation that we did because we had jira so either i had to build something or i explore jira right so i said let me explore how can i exploit jira in a good way i found all the things that i could do in th tool that i build or anything that any commercial platform has where you have a timeline comment section sending response assigning it to people all of that existed with jira but for a general person jira is just a ticketing system we thought let me explore how can we do it so all automation that you saw we did it in jira itself yep you had question right uh, so for example if there is a red team okay so the responsibilities uh, which they will have so is there any difference between the responsibilities between the uh, in the red team as well as in the bug bounty yes that is see Uh, as a point red team does acts as like a bug bounty hunters but they know they don't want to flood your system right they want to go ahead and see how far they can go to exploit system right being undetected but they just don't want to say run arcunetic like tons of scanners and flood you to see what works what doesn't work right they have a understanding of what methodology to follow to go about exploiting system bug bounty hunters because it's a thing now people run scanners people run so many things they see okay in one platform someone got rewarded so like last talk showed you right a key uh, put up in github uh, one of the companies paid $7000 the other company paid $15000 now would i let team do it probably probably not but it's something you should have monitoring in place regardless right bug bounty hunters is like okay you know what i found something pay me so the idea of what red team does versus what the mindset of a bug bounty hunter is different they just want money the easy simple bug which can make them earn money something they look for while red team is like how can i sophisticate my attack go ahead and exploit system thank you in your experience has an employee or ex employee ever abused the system sorry come again in your experience has hmm. an employee or an ex employee ever abused the system like they know the vulnerabilities and then people do it all the time you been able to catch this yep. kind of issues yep so that's what i'm saying the point of why you do this for do it for this or you do it for something else right how do you build an awesome detection system okay because what you don't know you don't know the point is hey i'll just give an example you say ki one of the talks that was today right talking about login otp right 
now the point is idly no one can exploit my OTP, right? Or no one can log in via my OTP, bypassing an OTP flow, logically, right? That's why I said like security is all about exploiting the nuances. Now, if someone has a valid OTP in your uh, DB and is still logged in, has a session, that's a problem, right? But you'll say logically that's not possible, I agree, but security is all about exploiting that. Now, can you put an alert around that? Ideally, you shouldn't get those alerts. You're putting alerts like, hey, this won't go wrong, definitely. But put up an alert, ki if it ever goes wrong, how do I detect it? Can someone sign up with the invalid phone numbers? No, because they have to fill in an OTP. But if you find someone signing up with less than 10 digit in India, let's say, send it up an alert. You should, the point is, how awesome detection system can you build to catch all of this? If you don't, you're like, hey, my security team would do it, my bug bounty hunters would do it, that's a wrong, Mindset itself. Any other question? Cool. Thanks.